I think what I'll do is I'll give the punchline to start out with. So what I'm going to do today is tell you how we came on the fact that the TOR pathway was very important in metabolism, uh, how it, I'll show you a model where it potentially is involved in, in tumor progression, and which is uh, due to overnutrition. And then finally, I'd like to tell you about uh, a paper we just published a few months ago where we talk about a novel uh, pathway which uh, uses glucose and uses energy uh, to control TOR and TOR activity, but independent of AMP kinase. So it's quite a surprise for a lot of people. Okay, so having said all that, this is actually a slide from one of my colleagues. Uh, let's get this out of the way here. One of my colleagues at the uh, GRI, Randy Seeley, who works on energy balance in the animal. He calls these the tools of mass destruction. I call them the tools of mass construction uh, leading uh, to obesity. And you've already heard uh, earlier on that, that obesity has been shown to be a high risk factor for a number of tumor types. Uh, this is in males. And specifically here, we're, we're going to be talking about uh, liver cancer, uh, where there's a five-fold higher effect. OK, this is the TOR pathway. And what we know is that this pathway is triggered by uh, two inputs. One is a growth factor input, which works through this canonical uh, PI3 kinase pathway, activation of PI3 kinase, activation of PKB suppression of this tumor suppressor complex, TFC1 and TFC2, which we initially identified by taking advantage of Drosophila genetics, as well as Reb, the small GTPase, which in the, in the GTP state acts as a positive factor to drive this pathway. However, we also know that nutrients are critical in this pathway. Initially, we thought they were simply permissive, but now we know they regulate this pathway as well. And this includes uh, branched-chain amino acids and glucose, and we know that they operate through a molecule called VPS34, or class 3 PI3 kinase, which is the ancient PI3 kinase, which is only found in yeast, uh, single PI3 kinase. And these novel molecules that uh, David Sabatini's group has defined, uh, the RAGs, uh, which are small GTPAs, and I'll be talking about that in a moment. So we know that these two pathways converge at the level of TOR. We know that the two major effectors that are being uh, uh, operated on downstream are this molecule, 4-EBP1, which is, a, again, a tumor suppressor which acts to bind to EIF4E, which is an initiation factor required to translate many messages which are, have very rich uh, five prime UTRs, which are rich in, in GC content and very hard uh, to unwind. As you might imagine, those, uh, those encode for uh, proto-oncogenes like cyclin D, growth factors like uh, VEGF. And so uh, when this protein is phosphorylated, it disengages from EIF4E and allows it to drive the translation of those messages. The other molecule is S6 kinase. Uh, which is known to phosphor the EF4B, S6, to suppress another kinase which is involved in, in uh, the rates of uh, the ribosomes move down, a messenger RNA, the transition. And finally, a molecule I don't show here on here, uh, 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 PDCD4, uh, which is another tumor suppressor which acts on another initi initiation factor called EIF4A. So we know that these uh, components, maybe I can use this instead, we know that these components converge uh, at the level of protein synthesis, and we know that. Uh, what they do is drive uh, cell size and cell proliferation, and we know when this goes aberrant, it can lead uh, to tumor progression. So this is sort of how the model stood, and, and this is sort of largely dr driven in a test tube. So the question was, uh, do any of these molecules actually have any impact on cell growth? So we set out initially to knock out S6 kinase in the mouse about 10 years ago, and what we saw was were that the mice were actually smaller in size. They're about 10 to 15 percent smaller in size. Uh, you can see that these animals are quite lean, which suggested to us at the time that there's something metabolically amiss with these animals. And so when we opened them up and looked at the fat pads, we saw that all the fat pads uh, were dramatically reduced. And when we looked by scanning electron microscopy, you can see the adipocytes are quite a bit smaller in size. If we do H&E staining and morphometric analysis, we see there's about a 70 percent reduction in the size of adipocytes. But you also see this multilocular-like phenotype. And this suggested that these animals were, this, instead of storing fat as triglycerides, that they were potentially breaking down fat uh, into free fatty acids and glycerol. And so to test that possibility, we isolated mature adipocytes from these animals and subjected them to a lipolysis experiment. And what you can already see at the basal level, that these animals are producing a tremendous amount of free fatty acid. Like the wild-type animals, they st these wild-type adipocytes, they still respond to a beta-adrenergic agonist, such as norepinephrine, so you can still activate, activate them fully uh, to the same extent that you see uh, in the wild-type animal. So what this experiment suggested to us was that these animals would be resistant to, to, to diet-induced obesity. So if we put them on a high-fat diet, we expected that they would put on less fat. 
Uh, no surprise, that's exactly what we found. Uh, in comparison to the wild type animals, these animals were severely uh, suppressed from uh, putting on fat. And they eat the same amount of food. Their energy uh, consumption is tremendously up in these animals, so they're, they're really burning a, a, a lot of energy, and they're quite, quite active. Now, uh, given the fact that uh, instead of storing fat, they're burning fat, uh, we looked at the free fatty acids in the blood, and what you can see is when we place these animals on a high fat diet, free fatty acids go up about threefold. So despite the fact that these animals are, are, uh, are uh, lean, um, we know that an increase in free fatty acids like this in the etiology of insulin signaling leads to insulin resistance. So we reasoned that even though these animals were resistant to a high fat diet, that they would be uh, insulin resistant. So we su subjected them uh, to an insulin tolerance test. I'm not getting used to advance. Sorry, there we go. We subjected them to an insulin tolerance test. These are the wild type animals. These are the knockout animals. In both cases, uh, we see glucose rising in the blood. In the wild type animals, you see that they become insulin resistant. We see insulin is rising in the blood, as is glucose. As glucose rises in the blood, insulin rises further. Uh, the insulin receptors begin to desensitize in these animals. Now, when we look at the, at the knockout animals, we find something very similar. But here we see free fatty acid is rising in the blood. Glucose is going up in the blood. Uh, and we see that the insulin receptors are desensitizing proportionally to the same extent. Yet these animals remain exquisitely insulin sensitive. So what that suggested was that in the absence of S6 kinase, somewhere downstream of the insulin receptor, we're facilitating uh, insulin signaling. Okay, so we looked at AKT downstream. We looked in liver, muscle, and, and fat. And I'll just show you the liver results because that's what we'll be talking about in a, in a few moments. And what you can see is if we look at wild-type animals that are maintained on a normal chow diet, if we, induce, if we inject insulin in the tail vein, you see within four minutes we see activation of AKT as a downstream target of insulin signaling. You see that that effect is stronger, though there's not enough numbers here to really power this data. But you can see the PKB becomes uh, more activated in the S6K knockout. But look at the high-fat diet. We put them on a high-fat diet. This is known. We, the insulin receptor becomes desensitized, and we suppress the ability of insulin to turn on uh, signaling downstream in that pathway. But in the absence of S6 kinase, what you see is that this pathway is unaffected. Now, we've been doing studies in Drosophila where we've been trying to look at the interactions between the PI3 kinase pathway and the TOR pathway. And what we, the only interaction that we could really see genetically was that in the absence of S6 kinase, we saw increased PKB activity, which was really the first indication of a potential feedback loop that was operating downstream of PKB uh, through S6 kinase to suppress insulin signaling. So we then, I'm trying to make this move, oh, oops. Okay, that what we then did was to take an insulin responsive cell line and to uh, treat that cell line uh, with RNAs to, to S6 kinase. So the first thing we did was to look at uh, wild type cells. If we stimulate them with insulin, you can see we activate AKT, we activate S6 kinase. But if we knock down S6 kinase, what you see is that we, we really potentiate uh, PKB signaling. Now, my interest sort of changed at this point because, you know, instead of thinking about the knockout animal, I started to think about the wild type animal. Because remember, PKB is down in these animals, yet these animals are growing uh, from head to tail or from head to anus, if you will, these animals are larger in size. Yet PKB is really suppressed, a major growth pathway. So how is this pathway driven? Well, we suspected it might be driven through the nutrient part of the TORP signaling pathway. So we looked at S6 kinase activity as a readout for TORP signaling in the wild type animal, not in the knockout. So, we're not, so under these conditions, if I go backwards for you, if I go back here, you'd see the PKB activity is suppressed. But if we go forward, Trying to go forward. What you see in that same animal is that S6 kinase activity is highly elevated. So what these studies suggested then was that nutrients coming through either branched chain amino acids or glucose are really driving the TOR pathway, and that's really driving uh, cell growth and cell proliferation downstream. But at the same time, when this pathway becomes hyperactivated, there's a feedback loop that comes in. It actually we went on to show that leads to the phosphorylation of IRS1 in positions which ag antagonize PI3 kinase binding to shut down this pathway. Brandon Manning recently had a paper in Molecular Cell showing that S6 kinase can also phosphorylate mTORC2, which is involved in regulating PKB phosphorylation and activation, and that can suppress uh, mTORC2 activity. Okay, so does this have any effect uh, in terms of tumorigenesis in the animal? So these are studies actually from Michael Karam, which appeared in Cell uh, earlier this year. And we're part of a mouse model in Human Cancer Consortium where we're using this model 
together with Randy Seeley and David Huey uh, at the, at the uh, MDI to study the effects of diet on tumor progression uh, in, in this model. And this model is the DEN model, nitrosal, uh, nitro, uh, ni uh, di uh, diethyl nitrosalamine, uh, which we inject into the animals about 15 days, uh, and they induce HCC in about 8 to 10 months. Uh, gene expression profile is very similar uh, to what a group of, of human HCCs is seen with very poor survival. And this comes from work from Snorri Thorgensen's lab at NCI. Oops, go back one. Um, and you can see foci as early as three months forming in these animals. So Michael put these animals on a high-fat diet, and what you see right away is that the incidence of uh, 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 the number of tumors increases, the maximum size increases on a high-fat diet, uh, as does the incidence. And if you do the same experiment in an OB, OB animal, where you put them on a normal chow diet, uh, what you can see is we greatly potentiate those tumors. This is in, in uh, uh, males, and this is in females over here. So then he went on to look at the TOR pathway. And like we'd shown earlier on, on a high-fat diet, uh, what you see is the PKB pathway shut down in the tumor, but what you see is heavy activation of the Essex kinase pathway. So now we're trying to ask downstream, you know, is it Essex kinase, is it 4-EBP1 uh, that's responsible for this tumor regression? I'll come back to that uh, in a moment. But it made us start to think about the fact that in these animals, when you put them on a high-fat diet, as I showed you earlier, glucose begins to rise in the blood. So how does glucose drive this pathway? So we published a paper in Science about 10 years ago where we showed that energy deprivation in this pathway really uh, shut down, so energy deprivation in the cell really shut down uh, towards signaling. And we suggested that that was potentially at the level of uh, ATP because, sorry, because uh, TOR has a very high KM for ATP in the millimolar range. So we suggested that potentially it could be happening at that level. But about that, uh, very soon after that, uh, Guam's group and Lou Cuntley's group uh, reported uh, that uh, glucose could suppress AMP kinase, which would then, uh, which is a positive effector of TSC, if you will, which would then uh, shut, would then uh, engage signaling in this pathway. So in other words, if we treat with an energy depleting agent, we activate AMP kinase, uh, that activates TSC and that shuts down uh, to our signaling. The thing that bothered us about this, as I said earlier, is we take advantage of Drosophila genetics because these pathways are highly conserved in Drosophila. We can move genetically very quick, we, and there's only single uh, uh, molecular components for many of these enzymes. For example, for S6K1, there's only one S6K1. There's no S6K2. For PKB, there's only one PKB. There's not three PKBs. So we can move quite quickly. And the thing that surprised us, when we looked at the phosphorylation sites in human TSC, uh, as compared to Drosophila, those sites were gone in Drosophila, yet we know this whole pathway is there. So the first thing we did was to take Drosophila cells in culture, S2 cells, and treat them with oligomycin, an inhibitor of, of, of mitochondrial oxidation, as we heard earlier. And as you can see, that, that very effectively and acutely shuts down this pathway. The pathway comes on again, uh, I, and I don't have time to show you the data, but as you heard from, from Dr. Pedersen ahead of me a few moments ago, that the cell will switch on uh, glycolysis under these conditions uh, to rescue the pathway, but I won't be showing you that data today. So what happens then if we knock down TSC1 and TSC2? If the effects of AMP kinase are going through TSC1 and TSC2, if we take them away, you'd expect that ener energy deprivation, deprivating agents wouldn't be able to shut down the pathway. So here we've taken away TSC1 or TSC2. Let's just concentrate on, on TSC2. You can see that the pathway becomes activated by just taking out this tumor suppressor because now REB is in the GTP state. It has very low uh, GTPase activity itself, so it, it's largely in the GTP activated state without uh, TSC present. But if we add oligomycin, you see that it totally shuts down uh, the pathway. So then we went to, to human cells and we looked at the effect of oligomycin in TSC minus and wild type cells. And what you can see here immediately is that uh, in, the, uh, in the wild type setting, uh, in the absence of TSC, the pathway is more elevated, but it's inactivated. Oh, sorry inactivated with very uh, similar kinetics. Okay, if then we look at 2-DG, 2-deoxyglucose, uh, and now we're inhibiting glycolysis, we see something very similar. Uh, we see a very acute response, I'm going too fast here, very acute response uh, in this, in this uh, signaling event. And the other thing you see is the pathway begins to be rescued at later times, and we could talk about that uh, later if you like. Now the criticism of this initial experiment was that the concentrations of 2-DG we're using are very high. So we're using 100 millimolars, 25 millimolar glucose uh, 
in, in, the, uh, in the cell culture medium. And remember, as Dr. Pedersen just explained to us, that what 2DG is doing is it's competing for, for binding to glucose uh, with uh, to hexakinase. Okay, so what we did is we did a titration, and sure enough, like Guam's group had earlier shown, we saw that as we titrated the concentration down of 2DG, we saw that there, that there really was resistance to this, to this, to, to, uh, to, to deoxyglucose. Now, they had suggested that this was due to osmotic shock, but this troubled us because the concentrations of oligomyosin we're using in these cells is 10 micromolar. So what it suggested instead is that the mechanism by which these two agents are shutting down the cell is quite, is quite distinct. And so uh, the thing we know from Bill Kalin's study, studies in this field, is that when we take out TSC, we activate HIF-1-alpha. And we know HIF-1-alpha drives glycolytic genes. And one of the glycolytic genes it drives is hexakinase-2. So the question was, is there more hexakinase-2 expressed in TSC2 deficient cells, which would make them more resistant to 2DG? And that's exactly what we found. So if we, if we look at hexakinase-2 levels, you can see that they're about two-fold higher in TSC2 deficient cells as compared to example tubulin or S6 kinase. And if we knock down hexakinase-2, we can show that these cells become, not surprisingly, more sensitive uh, to 2DG. So what about AMP kinase? Well, oh, sorry, I wanted to tell you one other thing. So this is more important, actually. So we know that uh, metformin is a major anti-diabetic drug. About 100 million people are taking this drug daily, and we know that it mimics uh, caloric restriction. Uh, it's a bungamide, which actually inhibits complex one. Uh, this is metformin. There's a lipolytic form, fenformin, which I'm sure a lot of you are, are familiar with. It's thought to have its major effects by reducing uh, uh, gluconeogenesis and increasing insulin sensitivity uh, in peripheral tissues. So what happens in the case of metformin, which is thought to operate by activating AMP kinase uh, through, TSC, uh, uh, through TSC? So here's metformin. Here's TSC wild-type cells. But if we do this, and what you see is that when we add metformin, we activate AMP kinase. Uh, we activate AMP kinase in, in TSC2 deficient cells, but you see we still suppress the pathway, okay, even in the absence of TSC, and we get very much the same results uh, with fenformin. And actually, this suggested for the first time that we could potentially start treating patients which suffer from tubular sclerosis syndrome uh, with metformin, and that has uh, potential benefits, and studies like that are going on right now based on this finding. Okay, so what about AMP kinase? Well, at this point, we got together with uh, 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 Bruce Kemp in Australia, and we got a, vote, a, a hold of his activated alleles. And sure enough, when we put these activated alleles in, they're very, uh, they're very efficient at shutting down the TOR pathways measured by S6 kinase phosphorylation and activation of AMP kinase. But we know that AMP kinase has a long-term effect on the cell. Not only does it have acute responses, but it also has long-term uh, genetic changes in, in, in the genetic profile, which could potentially affect this pathway. So what we were looking for was an acute way to activate this pathway. So we turned to ACAR. ACAR gets metabolized in this cell to an AMP mimetic. And when you add ACAR to cells, it's rapidly taken up, leads to activation of AMP kinase and phosphorylation of its downstream substrate, ACC. What about S6 kinase? What we see with ACAR with S6 kinase is the response is quite delayed, suggesting that we've separated the activation of AMP kinase from the, from the suppression of the TOR pathway. For example, if we look at 2DG, which is acutely activating AMP kinase as well as ACC, you can see it acutely shuts down this pathway. So we began, based on this experiment, we got suspicious that potentially metformin was not, activate, not acting through AMP kinase to shut down the TOR pathway. So at that point, we got together with Ben uh, Valet's group, who'd actually done the double knockouts of the alpha-1, alpha-2 subunit of AMP kinase, and we asked what the effect of 2DG was on the, TOR, on the TOR pathway. And here you can see uh, wild-type cells. These are the double knockout cells. If we add 2DG, of course, there's no activation of AMP kinase, no activation of ACC, because there is no AMP kinase in these cells. And now if we look at the TOR pathway, what you see is the TOR pathway is shut down just as effectively in the absence of AMP kinase as it is in the presence of AMP kinase. So what about uh, glucose? You know, 2DG people, if, if Greg Thompson was standing here, he'd tell you this is a hammer. So what about glucose? So if we take glucose away from cells, what you see is that we activate AMP kinase, which is scored by ACC phosphorylation. But if we do that same experiment in the double knockout cells, we take away glucose, uh, you see that we shut down the TOR pathway, no activation of ACC. So what about uh, metformin? Well, we reasoned first that ACAR would require AMP kinase to shut down this pathway. 
So the first thing we did was to look at ACAR. So ACAR, if we add ACAR to wild type cells, you see activation of, of AMP kinase, activation of ACC, and you see that the pathway is shut down. If we do that same experiment in the AMP kinase deficient cells, ACAR has no effect because ACAR works to this, to this AMP, AMP kinase uh, pathway. But if we look at metformin, what you see is metformin in the wild type cells, just like ACAR shuts it down, but it shuts it down just as effectively in the absence of AMP kinase, the TOR pathway. So Ruben Shaw has recently described a novel pathway by which AMP kinase phosphorylates Raptor at a unique position, 1792. That then uh, binds to 14.3.3, and that sequesters the TOR complex away from its substrates and shuts down signaling in this pathway. And you can see if we add metformin to wild-type AMPK cells, you can see that we phosphorylate 17.92, and that's associated with shutting down the Essex kinase. But in the absence of, of AMP kinase, there is no phosphorylation consistent with Ruben Shaw showed, but we still shut down the TOR pathway. So does this have any biological impact? Well, to address this question, we got together with uh, Andre, Andre Moret's group in, um, in uh, Quebec City, and we asked the question, what happens in L6 myotubes when you, when you downregulate uh, AMP kinase? And it's known that metformin, as well as ACAR, induces glucose uptake uh, in these cells, and part of that is through the suppression of the TOR pathway. And so what you can see is if we deplete these cells of AMP kinase and we add ACAR, now, what you can see compared to the scrambled RNA, that, like I showed you a moment ago in the MEFs, you see that there's no effect on the AMP kinase pathway, um, on, a, on the TOR pathway. But if we do the same experiment now with metformin, you see that we still uh, shut down this pathway in the absence of AMP kinase. So what about glucose uptake? Well, glucose uptake is stimulated by ACAR in the wild-type setting, but we knock down the alpha-1, alpha-2 catalytic subunits. We totally suppress that response. But there's absolutely no effect on the metformin response. So we're turning, on, we're turning off this pathway by energy depletion, or we're turning it on uh, by glucose, but we're turning it on independent of AMP kinase. So how does this work? Well, we began to think about mitochondria as well, because we know this is a major energy source. We began to think about metformin uh, knocking out system one. And there were a few reports in the literature. Uh, David Sabatini published a paper a few years ago showing that oxidation uh, agents which increase oxidation, like phenyl arsenate, will activate TOR, and that can block uh, the ability of agents like 2DG and oligomycin to suppress this pathway. Well, it's true that phenyl arsenate activates the pathway, but you can see that, that it's still inhibited proportionally to the same extent by 2DG and oligomycin. So that didn't appear to be the mechanism. Now, a paper appeared in Science about two years ago describing this protein, FKBB38, uh, which binds to mitochondria and also binds to TOR. It binds to the same region that rapamycin binds to TOR to inhibit TOR function. And so we've knocked down this molecule, as you can see here. Uh, if we add, and this is the scrambled RNA, this is FKBB38, we knock it down very effectively. But you can see if we add oligomyosin or 2DG, we still shut down the pathway. So it didn't appear to be going through any of these mechanisms. And I have to tell you, the postdocs were getting really uptight at this moment because, you know, we submitted this paper a couple of times. Everybody said, this is beautiful, but tell us what the mechanism is. And so it was about that time that David Sabatini in Guam uh, published the identification of these small molecules called RAGs, which are GTPases, which transport TOR to the lysosome where it, the lysosomal membrane where it can, or late endosomes where it can interact with REP and lead to the activation of TOR signaling. And that's dependent on nutrients, it's dependent on amino acids. So to cut the story short, what we know is that the phenotype of amino acids and glucose, so they operate differently upstream, is very similar in, in terms of their effect on TOR signaling. So we asked the question, uh, what happens in terms of forming these, uh, these uh, signaling complexes uh, in the presence of fenformin. So here you are in a growing cell. This is TOR stain. We're looking at mTOR staining now in these complexes. And I can tell you this is mTOR because we've done this in cells which are knockout cells uh, for mTOR and there is no signal. Okay, if we take away amino acids, what you see is that those complexes fall apart. Uh, if we add back amino acids, those complexes reform. But if we pretreat with fenformin, we block the formation of these complexes. So the next question we ask then is, is this potentially due to the fact that we're blocking amino acid uptake? And the answer is no, we're not blocking up amino acid uptake. So then we took advantage of the fact that we could use an activated allele of REB, which is in the GTP state, versus a wild type allele. And you can see that when we use the wild type allele, which we transfect in along with the reporter S6 kinase, you see that we can suppress signaling in this pathway with fenformin or by amino acid deprivation. But in the presence of the activated allele, we completely protect. 
So the question we're asking now is can we show mechanistically how metformin is giving, is giving this response? And to do that, what we know is, that, as I showed you a moment ago, what these RAGs do is recruit TOR and, and RAP TOR to these late endosomes. And you can score for that in a cross-linking experiment. So you can stimulate cells with amino acids and then cross-link this complex and then immunoprecipitate the flag RAG B. And so we've just set up this assay. I tell you, it's not easy to do. Uh, but we've got it set up and we've got it working. And so you can show if we add back amino acids, for example, pull down RAG, now we pull down increased amounts of, of Raptor and TOR. And we've done that experiment now with fenformin. We did it two days ago. I don't have the data here, but we show the fenformin uh, blocks this response. So where are we? Well, the first thing we'd like to know, are the effects of high-fat diet on uh, hepatocellular car carcinoma progression really driven uh, through mTORC1? If they're really driven through the mTORC complex, We'd like to know whether these effects can be reversed by rapamycin or metformin, which shut down this pathway. Uh, if so, are the effects driven by S6K1 and or 4-EBP1 phosphorylation? Uh, those are questions that we're asking right now in the lab as part of this Mouse Models and Human Cancer Consortium. Uh, does metformin and, fen and fenformin inhibit RAG binding to mTORC1? Actually, I just told you the answer to that question. I didn't show you the data, but we have the data now. And so finally, if so, what is the underlying mechanism? And if so, would this serve as a potential therapeutic target? So now we're trying to get at the question of how uh, energy agents like fenformin are blocking this interaction uh, downstream. And we're mechanistically trying to take that apart. And I'll stop there. I'd just like to mention the people that have uh, carried out these studies. The studies that we're carrying out as part of the Mouse Model Consortium are being carried out with Randy Seeley and David Huey uh, at the MDI. The studies that I talked about right now uh, in terms of metformin were carried out by Anand in the lab and, and Adam uh, Callender. And I'll stop there. Thank you. I frightened everybody away. Yeah, so, so, you know, there, there, there is, um, you know, amino acids are, are metabolized in mitochondria and there's retrograde signaling going between mitochondria and TOR, which is taking place. But leucine amongst the, the branched chain amino acids is sufficient to drive the pathway. And what's known is that uh, branched chain amino acids are elevated in obese people. Uh, Barbara Kahn has recently shown that the major site of metabolism of branched chain amino acids is, is adip adipose tissue. That was a paper just published. And she showed very nicely that if you increase, if you, if you have a high fat diet and you suppress that, uh, you suppress the metabolism of branched chain amino acids, which then become elevated. And of course, then the branched chain amino acids uh, can drive the TOR pathway. I have one question. Have you, you put these animals on a high fat diet? Have you tried to put them on a calorie restriction diet to see that, are we able to withstand the diet? So uh, we're very heavily involved in those studies. We're not only looking at caloric restricted diet, we're looking at ketogenic diets as well, looking at uh, cholesterol diets as well. And uh, those, those studies are going on uh, right now. Um, I, I wanted to say, and it's good you stood up, because I wanted to say, you know, we just published a paper in Science a few months ago with Dominic Withers, and we've shown that the S6K1 knockout animals live longer, as do many of the components in this TOR pathway when they're knocked out. And uh, those animals fail to put on adipose tissue uh, 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 with time. And, and actually, if you look at the, the uh, gene, gene profile of the liver, it looks like a caloric restricted uh, diet. Interestingly, those animals are protected against bone. And uh, my collaborator in the lab, uh, Sarah Kozma, who I work with, is actually my wife, um, has looked at Essex kinase in terms of blocking uh, adiposity. And actually, she worked it all the way, she just published a paper in, uh, in developmental cells showing that if you knock down S6 kinase, what happens is you, stem cells fail uh, or are very inhibited in terms of making adipose, uh, but they're greatly facilitated in terms of making bone, whereas rapamycin blocks both of those responses. So S6K1 looks like somehow it's very selective for insulin responsive uh, tissues. I'd like to uh, certainly acknowledge the appreciation for Elias Thank you for all of our speakers and thank you audience for staying with us.